Welcome back to another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic, where I help solve and remedy any of your bike-related technical problems. I know just how frustrating it is when you can't go out riding, so make sure if you've got a problem, leave it down there in the comments section for me, and I'll do my best to answer it. Let's crack on then. First question this week is from Matt, who says, how do I change to a different one by SRAM chainring? Would I have to recalibrate everything or anything, or would it just be a case of extending the chain? Right then, Matt. Well, it does, to be honest, depend on how many teeth you are adding or losing from your current setup. But I would say, uh, say four teeth either way. So if you're upgrading by four teeth or going four teeth lower, then you should be all right with the current chain. That is, of course, unless your current chain is really stretching to accommodate when you're riding in the lowest sprocket, so the biggest one at the back. So just have a closer eye on that. But I think four either way, you should be okay. The next question is something which I am particularly fond of, certainly when it comes to fiddling around. Let's have a look though. Alan Taylor Farns. Hi John, I think I have a weird alignment issue because I feel like I'm sat more to one side of the bike. I wonder if my handlebars aren't perfectly placed in the center, but it isn't something I can eyeball. Do you have any tricks or tips on how to make sure the handlebars are perfectly centered and that the wheels are perfectly straight with the stem? Right then, Alan, there is nothing worse than this. I'm particularly particular about this certain issue. So have a look at your handlebars, either side of the actual stem, so where they sit in the stem there. In most cases, they have some little lines. Use them as a guide. They should be even on both sides of the stem. That way you know your handlebars are going to be perfectly central. As for getting the stem spot on in line with the front wheel, that is something which can be really, really difficult because you close one eye, knock the stem, that's in line, close the other eye, knock it, and you can just play tennis essentially with it all day long. What I would suggest, undo your stem bolt slightly, just enough that you can turn the handlebars, and then get yourself a plumb line, so a bit of string with some weight on the end, and hang it right from dead center in the middle of the stem. I'm hoping you can find this, it should be a lot easier then hang it down and you want that weight to be touching exactly on the middle of the tire. And then you can tighten up those stem bolts and you're good to go again. But I know just how frustrating it is when you're convinced that something isn't quite right with the bike position. Hopefully though, you're gonna be all straight and ready to go. Peanut boy, sounds like they've been riding out in the wet. Anyway, uh, hi, I noticed after a rainy ride, yeah, they've been out in the wet, uh, that water had gathered inside my wheel, not inside the tube, but between the tube and the tire. There was quite a bit of it too, enough for Peanut Boy to clearly hear it inside of the wheel when turning it. Uh, I recently changed from butyl tubes to latex. I've never had these problems with butyl. Is this common with latex tubes and is there a way to stop the water from getting in? Right then, Peanut Boy. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it shouldn't be any different using butyl or latex tubes, so I don't see any correlation necessarily with that. As for stopping water getting in, without sealing up all of the, the room around your spoke nipples and valve hole, then no, there isn't really a way of stopping it getting in. Uh, now I've had this happen to wheels over the years, a bit of water getting there and you can in fact hear it, but don't worry, it finds its way out and I've never had any ill effects on any parts due to it being in there. It will find its way out. If you're particularly worried, maybe put it near a dehumidifier or a radiator and it should dry out even quicker. Stefan Hofmeister is next up this week. So Stefan says, hey John, I'm replacing my 105 5800 short cage rear derailleur with an Altegra R8000 medium cage rear derailleur. I'm keeping the same gearing of a compact chain set with an 11 to 28 cassette, but I'm replacing my chain. Do I need to change the length of the chain compared to the old chain? Thanks mate. Right then. I'm a bit confused here why you want to go from a short cage to a medium cage because your current short cage will actually be able to accommodate that 28 tooth sprocket. But I'm guessing you just fancy that new fancy R8000 Shimano Ultegra rear mech. So there we are. As for the length of the chain, yep, yeah, it's very likely you are gonna have to have a couple of pairs extra links in there to take up the distance of that longer cage rear derailleur. All the best. Heli Case 21 has got a braking question. All right, I'm planning on buying a bike with the older Shimano RS505 hydraulic brake and shifters. If I want to upgrade some slightly smaller levers, say the Shimano 7000 series, do I need to buy a new caliper as well, or can I just pull the hose off the existing ones and re-bleed the system? Right, Heli Case, I like your thinking on this one because those levers which you currently have, well, 
They're pretty big, aren't they, to be perfectly honest, and they're not to everybody's taste. The good news is, is that your current calipers will work absolutely fine with the RS785 shifters stroke brake levers that you're talking about, because, yeah, they use the same mineral oil, and also they're cross-compatible. So you're all good to do that, and you're gonna have those much nicer looking shifters, especially in my opinion, anyway. Now, Umar Chowdhury has got an electrical question, something which pops up every week as electronic group sets get more and more popular, which is fantastic. Umar's question is, hi John, great show as always. That's not his question, he's just saying it, but you know what I mean. Uh, I've just built up my first bike with DI2. Are there any differences in cleaning procedures for an electronic group set bike versus mechanical? Right then, Umar, nope, there aren't. So treat it just as you would a normal mechanical group set. So don't go jet washing wildly on the internals or anything like that. But something you may want to invest in just for peace of mind is some silicone grease. So put it around the cable entry points on your components and that will stop any water from ingressing. Uh, also, Finish Line, I believe, they make a special electronic group set cleaner. So again, you know, if you really do want that peace of mind, maybe invest in some of that. And then finally, perhaps some contact cleaner, which is great for cleaning up electronics because it works in such a way that it dissolves. So there we are. Anyway, you're gonna enjoy that DI2. Next up is a question from Nathan Phillips. Okay, please, 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 can you explain to me why on earth cleats are made from plastic that wears down quickly? And is it possible to use metal alternatives for SPDSL or look? Nathan, cracking question. Uh, it brings me back to my youth or certainly, well, younger than youth, I suppose reading the back of Winning magazine, and there used to be a company that advertised in there called Foster Cleats. And these cleats were made out of aluminium. And essentially, at first, they seemed like the do-it-all answer, I guess, to your exact question. However, if you look at a pedal body, they're quite soft, really. And certainly, a aluminium cleat would wear away at that pedal body, rendering it useless because most riders do have a little bit of ankle movement or maybe even a bit of rocking. So a harder wearing aluminium cleat is gonna wear away that pedal, which isn't good for anyone. So for the small cost of a consumable like a pedal cleat, I can see why foster cleats are no longer around, or certainly not that I know of. I reckon people out there will know about foster cleats. If you had some, and did they destroy your pedals or anything like that, let me know in the comments section down below. There's one person in particular, Mr. Grumpy 53 who I know watches every single one of our videos. He will have heard of these cleats, I guarantee it. Now, Stewie Wooey, what a name. Come on, Stewie, fair play to you. Uh, I've recently moved to Snowdonia and it's a tad hilly. Uh, so I needed to recable my rear mech anyway due to fraying. I thought I'd upgrade from 10 speed Tiagra to a wider range 11 speed 105. I'm a cheapskate, however, so I was hoping just to do the bare minimum lever, cable, derailleur, cassette, and chain. Would this work or are 10 speed chain rings different somehow? It will work just fine. Fine. I've used 10 speed chain sets with 11 speed drive trains and it works absolutely spot on. And I don't blame you really if you're moving up to Snowdonia because having a widespread or a wider spread ratio of cassette with less big jumps when you are up in those low gears is probably ideal for that. Oh, and as for being a cheapskate, there's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm happily a cheapskate. Henry Yanneke Lane would like to know, I'm currently running Shimano 105 5800 and I'm planning to slowly upgrade to Altegra R8000 or 105R7000. I would start upgrading the derailleurs. Could I run into some compatibility problems? Right, first up, that new Shimano 105 group set looks absolutely fantastic. And I've just been checking through my compatibility charts and you will not run into any problems whatsoever. They're totally interchangeable. So there you are. Now it's just a decision, Ultegra or 105, which are you gonna go for? Now that I've told you it works, let me know down there in the comments, which are you gonna choose? Final question, or questions even, this week from Guero Blanco, who has sent in two questions. Cheeky. Right, let's tackle the first one though. Uh, if my tubeless tire is already a little bit damaged, does it make sense to take an inner tube with me while riding? Can I stick it in when my tubeless sealant doesn't work anymore or the tire fails? Right then, I would always take an inner tube anyway, even if your tire is brand new because you never know what could happen when you're out riding. But in your case, definitely take one because that tire is slightly damaged. And yeah, it will work absolutely fine if you do run into an emergency. Let's have a look at your next question though. Does it make sense to put a 28 millimeter tire in the back 
and a 25 mm tire in the front for aerodynamic reasons, or should I just use 28? Right then, I'm not sure about the aerodynamic benefits or gains that you would get from putting a 25 compared to a 28, because there's a huge amount of variables out there. But generally on the road, if you are gonna mix up your widths of tires, you would put the wider tire on the rear. So it gives you a little bit of extra grip and also a little bit of extra comfort. And who doesn't like a little bit of extra comfort? So there we are, nearly time for the end of this week's GCN Tech Clinic, but don't go just yet, because if you've got a problem, leave it down there in the comment section and I will do my best to help solve it. And remember as well to like and share this video with a friend. Sharing is caring after all and all that. And also remember to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com where we have a whole heap of products and goodies for you to get stuck into. And now for another great video, this time how to get rid of a creaky bottom bracket a problem which people think they've got, and maybe it's not a creaky bottom bracket. Anyway, if you've got one, click just down here.